Well, good morning, Open Door. It's Caleb Lynch back with you. You just saw me a second ago. I know it's weird. I like change my clothes really quickly. Um, it's magic. I don't. I can't. Magician never tells the secrets. Hey, um, this is that time of our Sunday morning service where I want to give you a quick COVID update. Um, I got a bunch of details for you. Uh, I will try to keep it condensed and short, but I do want to make sure. Uh, everyone is on the same page and that you know that we are doing everything in our power to get us back together in a building together and do it in a way that is healthy and safe for everyone who um, is ready to be there. So a couple of things. You'll see pretty soon here when I, when I start my sermon, I am not doing it from the auditorium like I told you I would be. Um, today we were going to do a, a bit of a dry run, a bit of a practice trial run. Uh, we're going to bring all the volunteers and have them practice uh, going through uh, what it would look like for next week, uh, which is when we were all going to gather back together. Uh, it didn't happen this week uh, for a couple of different reasons, uh, but the main one being we were given some information uh, that someone within our community might have been exposed um, to, the, um, to the coronavirus. And so to keep everyone safe, to keep everyone uh, healthy, we, we saw it, it as the right thing to do to not have a bunch of us. There was going to be about 40 to 50 of us gathering this Sunday. Um, we just felt like, man, let's, let's just err on the side of caution. And so we're, we're not actually gathering. Uh, I'm in my office right now uh, at the church, but uh, there's no one in, in the Sunday morning auditorium. And um, we, we might go through a, a practice run later this week. Who knows? Um, we're, we've got it all kind of up in the air and we're, we're trying to figure out a plan. But um, this all happened, um, these decisions happened uh, late yesterday, so we didn't get a chance to inform you about it sooner. But our hope, our prayer, our desire is that we would uh, get to open up our campus uh, this next week. And uh, if you tuned in last week, you heard that the 14th was our reopen date, and that is still the plan as of right now. That could certainly change, as you know. Um, but here's, here's what you need to know about that Sunday. We have an 8 a.m. service that is for our high-risk families, our high-risk individuals, uh, that will be a mandatory mask-wearing service. So if you attend that service, uh, we will ask you to wear a mask. If someone shows up randomly, uh, we will have masks available. Um, all of our volunteers will be wearing masks. It will be mandatory. Uh, there will be one time, and I just wanna make sure you hear this so that, that you can make a decision for yourself if it's right for you to be there or not. There will be one time when there won't be a mask being worn, and that'll be for me when I'm teaching. Um, we have positioned the podium uh, about 15 to 20 feet away from um, the closest individual, um, and, and that was the distance we were told uh, was the safe distance. And just with how the microphone, and, and for those that are trying to listen at home, uh, it wasn't gonna work for me to wear a mask. So that will be the only time. Same thing with the worship. The worship uh, uh, leaders will actually be even a little bit further back so more like 20 to 30 feet. Um, but either way, wanted to make sure that was super, super clear. We will also have a 10 o'clock and a noon. So an eight for our high-risk families, a 10 o'clock and a noon. The 10 and the noon, uh, it's, it's not that we're not gonna be extra careful with those ones. We will certainly be super careful. Those will just not be a mandatory mask wearing service. If you feel more comfortable wearing a mask, um, you're more than welcome to, but they will not be mandatory uh, for those services. Um, a couple of things you need to know. We have a whole crew of people that we are going to be training uh, in between and before services to sanitize literally everything. We have some solution that was given to us that is some powerful stuff, and it's able to be used on our fabric chairs, on, on um, hard surfaces, and we will be using it all over the place. So you can, you can trust uh, that everything will be really, really clean. We're also, after the service is over, the services are going to run a little bit shorter. We're going to have a full hour where no one will be uh, in the auditorium. And that'll give us plenty of time for it to air out, for the air to circulate through and make it really clean and healthy for the next group of people to come in for their service time. So as soon as service gets over, we're going to kick you out of there and uh, we'll shut the doors and then um, we'll allow it to really clear out. And then we won't open those doors again until it's time for everyone else to come back in. Uh, communion will be done a little bit differently. How we hand out uh, bulletins and porticos, those will be done a little differently. How we do some other little uh, smaller things will be done differently. But you need to know 
We have uh, gotten the chairs all steam cleaned. The carpets have been steam cleaned and shampooed. Uh, the auditorium is actually probably the cleanest it's ever been um, uh, at this point. So we are ready for you on the 14th. We are excited uh, and we will give you a ton more information. But as always, I want you to know, we're gonna continue as best we can to keep providing content and sermons for those of you that are at home. Um, be flexible with us, be gracious with us. We're still trying to figure it out. We're getting some new cameras installed in the auditorium so that hopefully you can experience what everyone else is experiencing if you choose to stay home. But for the meanwhile, it might look something like this. We don't quite know yet. So hang in there with us. Uh, I promise you this, you still will get uh, a Sunday morning experience if you are at home and you are still as important and so much a part of this community, uh, even if you don't feel comfortable showing up uh, during this time. We totally get it. Um, I'm trying to think if that's it. I think that's it for right now. We've got a bunch more this morning. I won't keep you. Um, I've got a message. Uh, I'm going to be trying to kind of address uh, a little bit of, of our climate right now and uh, the topic of racism and trying to include it a little bit into this conversation we've been having now for I think 11 or 12 weeks on pause and maybe how do those come together uh, in a healthy way. So stay tuned. I love you guys. I miss you. Can't wait to see you. We'll see you next week. Uh, fingers crossed, hopefully. Um, but in the meanwhile, stay healthy, stay safe. And um, I love you. We'll see you in a little bit.
I'm back with you and uh, if you're just tuning into this part just joining us my name is Caleb Lynch and I'm the lead pastor here at Open Door Fellowship Church um, if you don't know much about Open Door Fellowship if you've just found us we are just a group of people um, who have been um, man I, I would just say it this way have been undone by the freedom and the love that we have found in a guy named Jesus Christ and we don't know what else to do except for to gather together and to worship his name and to um, let the truth of um, the things we find in God's word shape our hearts and our lives. And um, gosh, that, that's who we are. So if, if uh, you, gosh, if you've never, if you never joined us before, we're, we're in Phoenix, Arizona. Look us up on the internet. It's Open Door Fellowship Church. You'll find us. I believe in you. And we'd love to, we'd love to get to hang out with you, get to know you after all this crazy COVID stuff is over. Um, man be great to meet you. Well, hey, we, um, we are uh, kind of coming to an end of a, of a series. If, uh, if you haven't been with us, we've been in a series called Pause. Pause. We, we've seen this time of COVID and Corona as a forced pause. Uh, for many of us, it has gone longer than we would have liked. That's me. Um, but nevertheless, we believe that there has been beauty to be found in this pause. So we've chosen uh, to try to pull out some of that beauty and to say, gosh, what would it look like um, for us to slow down and to really take a deep breath and to say, God, what are you up to uh, in here, in me? What, how, how are you shaping me? How are you molding me? What, what, what are you going to use during this time to reorient the way I see myself, the way I see God, the way I see his scripture, the way I see hope and peace and freedom? Uh, how, God, how are you moving? How are you shaping me? What is, it, what is it doing in the way that I come before the Father in prayer? What is it doing for me in the way that I, that I slow down to see accurately who I am? and um, what, what he's doing. So that's what we've chosen to, to stop and to do. And today we're going to continue in it. We're kind of coming to an end. I'm hoping this is our last week of it because I'm, I'm ready for something uh, a little bit new and I've got a, I've got a new series that's coming out for us. Um, but before we jump into it, um, our world, our United States, our, our cities um, have been torn up um, physically, emotionally. Uh, man, we, we have been in crisis. We, we had this virus and, um, and then just over the last week or so, um, we've entered into a, a crazy conversation and it has been polarizing and it has been scary at times with some of the things we've seen. Uh, it has been hopeful uh, in a lot of ways. And so, um, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about it. Actually, I'm, I'm going to try to spend uh, the next 20 minutes talking about it. And my hope is that um, we as a church, that we don't stop talking about it. And um, if you ever find that um, seasons go by and I haven't been talking about it, will you remind me to talk about it? 
because we are in the middle of something that I believe is extremely important, extremely significant, and um, I don't want to miss it. Hang in there with me. I need your grace. I need your patience with me. I know, um, I know that the things I'm about to talk about, um, I will never fully understand. I just won't. Uh, I'm about to dive into the conversation of racism. I'm about to dive into the conversation um, of, of uh, really what we are seeing right now as a call to unity, as a call uh, to fight against injustice. And um, I know fully well that I will never fully understand all the ins and outs of this conversation. And um, so be gracious with me. I am, I am a white male, uh, part of the middle to upper class, and I, I know I probably have zero business um, discussing these things, but here I am. And um, there's a bunch of you on the other side of this camera, and uh, hopefully this is a beginning of a conversation that will shape this community. Uh, hopefully this is a beginning of a way of seeing that will shape this community. Um, so stay with me. Um, I'll start by, um, by saying this. I, I, I don't intend to represent um, everyone in this conversation. I, I know I can't do that. Already uh, in the last week, I have been pursued and contacted and Facebook messaged and text messages from many of you and, and many outside of our community um, with differing views, differing concerns, differing hopes, differing dreams. And so I know that it would be uh, absolutely impossible for me to try to represent all of you. And that's not my intention. My intention is to point all of us to someone. And uh, that someone, uh, his name is Jesus. And we'll get there. I would not be honest. I would not be truthful to myself if I, if I did not start this conversation um, by starting by saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry um, for being silent as long as I have. I'm sorry that I let... Um, the fear of not having the right words or the right language or the right way of saying things pertaining to racism or oppression um, for the black community or, quite frankly, for um, any of our colored communities. I'm sorry that I um, was fearful of what diving into this conversation might do, and so I remained silent. I'm sorry. I'm sorry um, for not being affected more appropriately. My privilege um, has allowed me to not be moved by the injustice, the oppression, and the racism the way that I hoped it would. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I um, I'm sorry that I have not pursued those of you that um, have been a part of the minority culture and I haven't pursued you to hear your story, to hear what you're going through, to hear your feelings, to hear your heart. I'm really sorry. I'm sorry to my kids. They're young, but there have been many opportunities, many times in our life where I could have shared with them the injustices of this world. 
the oppression of this world. I could have shared with them more about what was wrong and what I saw and how our Jesus, how our God sees his creation and how there's distortion and pain and darkness. And I, sorry to you, my kids, that I have not entered into these conversations with you And I'm sorry to this church. As the main communicator of hopefully what I would believe is truth, hopefully what I would believe is the things that I'm communicating are love and peace and hope, um, I've remained uh, entirely silent on these issues of racism, prejudice, oppression, Whatever title you want to give it, you know what I'm talking about, and I am sorry. As for all of your forgiveness, Lord, I, uh, I ask for your forgiveness, and I, I know it's weird to ask for your forgiveness because I know you already paid for all my junk, all my sins, all my past, my present. I, I know it's already been paid for. And so, um, maybe I don't ask for your forgiveness, Lord. Maybe, maybe it, it's more of, I'm just here to say I'm sorry that I haven't um, loved your image bearers, those that represent the image of their creator, uh, that maybe I haven't loved them um, protected them, um, stood with them the way that I know you would, Lord. And so I'm, I'm sorry. Um... I, uh, I want to tell you, I put on a good face, I put on a good smile, but I'm, I'm a mess right now. These last two, three months have been so hard for me, and um, I feel like no matter what I say or what I do, um, there are those, even within our community, that get frustrated with me. And I'm sorry, uh, I'm trying to lead us well to truth. I'm trying to point us to a guy named Jesus. Stay with me. Stay with me in this conversation. Um, I believe, I believe wholeheartedly this is, has nothing, listen to me, this has nothing to do with politics. Have politics gotten involved? Sure. There's just not about anything you can do anymore without it being fully charged with some political agenda involved. I, I hear it. I get it. This is not a conversation of politics. This is not a conversation about police officers. Listen, some of my dearest friends are police officers and they are beautiful. Men. They are super courageous protectors of human life. This, this, is, this is not a conversation about them. This is not a conversation about a president or any kind of policy or program or any kind of ballot. This is a conversation about the heart. You see, we, we put laws in place in the 60s. But until hearts get changed, we're just, we're just spinning. We're just yelling. And we're trying to yell over the top of the next guy.
Listen, we would be fools. Listen to me. We would be fools to put our hope and faith in some police system, some politics, some president, some policy. We would be fools. That is fading. Those things will not last. They turn over every four years to begin with. No, no, no. Stop with me. Pause with me. This is a matter of the heart. This is a story of humanity. All of us. This is a story of groaning deep within our souls. This, this longing for reconciliation, redemption, unity, forgiveness. This is a broken race of human beings from a garden that are waiting to be restored by the Creator Himself. This is a story of the heart. Stay with me. Stay with me. I want to tell you a story. I'm going to set this down for a second. Last week, well, this, a few, few days ago, um, I wake up in the morning. I think it's a Wednesday. I don't even know. The days are all blurring together right now. I have no idea. It is, it, I, don't, I think today is Sunday. I don't know. Um, and I get this notification on Facebook. And it's this notification, it's called AZ Churches Stand Together. And it's an invitation from a few church pastors, a, a, a couple um, black pastors from our church community here, and they're inviting hundreds if not thousands of pastors to head downtown at 545 and go on a march down to the Capitol and then gather to pray over our city, to call on the name of the Lord, and to gather together in unity as church leaders, as those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. And so, not knowing what to do, feeling super fragile in this time, not knowing what to say, not knowing where, ah, um, I, I, I turn to Kaylee and I say, will you go with me to this thing? And Kaylee's my wife, if you don't know that. And she says, of course, let's go. And we have no idea what we're getting ourselves into. We just show up and we get there 40 minutes early because we're afraid that there's not going to be any parking, which there wasn't, because thousands upon thousands of people who have put their trust in Jesus Christ have showed up. I I'm telling you, literally almost every single church in this state was represented that night. I saw pastors uh, from dozens and dozens and dozens of churches, and we literally and, 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 and emotionally and, and physically, we linked arms and we called on the name of the Lord together. It was, it was one of the most powerful experiences of my life. But can I tell you the part that shaped me the most? We gather in front of the Capitol, thousands of us, and... Um, one of the main organizers, a, a black preacher from, from one of the redemption churches, he stands up and he, he, he kind of quiets the crowd. He says, hey, stop, everyone stop, 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 stop. And he says, listen here, let us make no mistake about why we are gathering. Let us make no mistake as to why we are gathering. And I'm not going to quote him accurately, but these were his next words. He says, listen, we've tried everything else. Hundreds of years have gone by, and we've tried everything else. We're gathering this day because we believe there is one power, one source of hope, one source of peace that is strong enough to change this situation and his name is Jesus Christ so we gather to call on his name and this group erupts tears are flowing down people's face I'm crying we're worshiping we're hopeful we're, we're, we're calling out to God 
all in like one breath. And then pastor after pastor after pastor uh, of the black community, black preachers, and they get up and they pray and they preach. And we were there for an hour and a half that night. And not one of them carried with them some kind of agenda other than calling on the name of Jesus Christ for the hope of humanity. It was amazing. Politics were nowhere to be found. It was a group of people saying, Jesus, we need you. We don't have another plan outside of you. It was, it was life-changing for me to see in that moment. And I said, ah, oh, that I can stand with. Are there, are there policies and things that could get into place that could help? Sure, 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 sure. But for me and for this church, There is one that we are going to put our hope in during this time, and his name is Jesus. We don't, we don't have another choice. We don't have another choice. Jesus, we call on you. We know you are there. We hear verses, Jesus, that say that there is the, no, no longer any Jews or Greeks or Gentiles or male or female or slave or free man, that all are unified under your name, Jesus. And so we call on you, Jesus. We know that there is power to be found in your name, and we need it, Lord. I want to tell you this, I, I have never been more proud of the church than I was that night. It was so much fun, and yet we're digging into something that is really oppressive, really hard. And I left there hopeful. I left there hopeful. Can you believe that? I was reminded again of the one we put our trust in. It was a sweet evening. My boy Jeff Chupp snuck up through the crowd behind me and, and said hello. And uh, man, we linked arms that night. God is doing a work in my heart like, um, like I don't have words for. I've said to that to you many, many times. Um, but in these last couple of weeks, I have been moved by compassion and love like I have never been before. And so I invite you in. Today, we are um, we're titling this message, Pause. We're in this pause series. We're titling it, Pause to Move. Pause to be moved. Pause to move. Um, there was one who was moved, saw the wickedness and the darkness of what human beings could do to each other. And he said, I'll, I'll, I'll go down and I will enter into the mess and I will make a way where there was no way before, where there was no power or authority or a, or a leader or a policy or a program or a law ever before that could change hearts, that could set captives free, I'll come, he says, and I'll, I'll make a way. He was so moved by the human race and the darkness of their souls that he said, uh, sign me up, put me in, coach. Do you remember... When um, Jesus, he's in, he's in the garden, there's this garden, he's with his disciples, and he's about to be arrested to go be put on a cross. Do you, do you remember that, that scene? He's, he's weeping blood, he's so stressed out by what he's about to experience, and he calls out to the Father. And, and in that prayer, can I, can I, I'm just going to read this for you. Um, 
this is in the, the NET Bible. I love the translation, but this is uh, John 17, 20 through 23. This is Jesus's prayer. I'm not praying only on their behalf, but also on the behalf of those who believe in me through their testimony. That they will all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, I pray that they will be in us. So that, they, so that the world will believe that you sent me. The glory you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and, and you in me, that they may be complete, one. So that the world will know that you sent me, and you have loved them just as you have loved me. His prayer in the last moments was that we, as human beings, would be one, would be unified. He, um, he left humanity with a gift, though. Did you hear what he said? He said, I in them. He left you with his spirit. The very spirit of Jesus Christ himself who called out to the Father in some of his last breaths and begged for you unity. That very spirit, that very longing, that very desire he left with you and I. You see, there is a remedy for this current climate and it indwells you me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Here's one of the, the most astounding things about Jesus Christ. This, this boggles my mind, but it's one of the things I love most about him. Jesus Christ knew the beginning from the end. He's God, right? He, know, he knows it all. He can see it all. He can see the beginning from the end. He knows what's happening. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what that person's going to say and this person's going to do. And he knows what he's about to do. And yet, throughout all of the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, we see him walking around, interacting with the human race, and time and time and time again, we see these words. And Jesus was moved by compassion. All over. Moved by love. Had compassion for. Felt the need and moved. You see it all throughout Scripture, this God who knows it all, knows what's coming His way, and yet He allowed the afflictions, the oppression, the, 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 the racism, the outsiders, He allowed their current condition to move Him. Is that astounding to you like it is to me? What kind of God would let the shortcomings of his creation touch his heart in such a way that it would literally redirect him to love? We serve a different kind of God. We follow a different kind of deity, my friends. His name is love. Let me tell you just a couple stories because I like the Bible and I like what it has to say. And there you go. So there's a story of this widow and her son passes away. And she, she, she brings her son out into the street. She doesn't know what to do. She's a widow. She's all by herself. She, she's an outcast from society. And, and, and she doesn't know what to do. She's, she's got her, her dead son on a cart and she's walking him through town. And Jesus sees her and it says, and beholding her, this is Luke 7, uh, right in the middle of 11 through 17 is where the story is. And he says, and this is right at 13, and beholding her, the Lord was moved with compassion over her. And he said to her, 
be not weeping. And then he tells the boy to get up, and he gets up, and he starts talking. <laughs> That's how the, how the scripture records it. And he sat up and started talking. And all those who watched, verse 16 says, God has come to help his people. They saw this power, this source of authority, be moved to love an outsider without anyone else to help her, and they said, the people standing around said, God has surely come to help his people. That's verse 16. Another story, this is in Matthew 9, 36. It talks about Jesus going from town to town, preaching in the, in, in, in the synagogues and, and to the people and to the masses. And it says this, And when he saw the crowds talking about Jesus, he was deeply moved with compassion for them. And, and, and here's why. Listen to why he was moved. Because they were troubled and helpless, like a sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 20. Uh, it's a story of two blind men that are healed. Uh, I'll, I'll pick it up in 29, verse 29. And they were leaving Jericho, and a large crowd followed them. Two blind men were sitting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. The crowd scolded them to get them to be quiet. The crowd scolded them. But they shouted even more loudly, Lord, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped, and he called them, and he said, what do, you, what do you need from me? What do you want me to do? And they said, Lord, let our eyes be opened. Verse 34, moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes. And immediately they had sight, and they followed him. And how many times did you see Jesus associate with those um, Samaritans, those half-breeds, those half-Gentile, half-Jews that didn't belong, that were the minority culture? How many times did you see Jesus sitting at a well with one of them? How many times did you see Jesus make them the hero of the story? So pause. Pause to remember that the character of Jesus as he walked the streets was one who would stop. He would pause so that he could be moved by compassion. He would stop what he was doing and he would leave the 99 to go after the one. Was it because the 99 were not as important as the one? No. The 100 is what's important. That the 99 and that the one would be brought together. And Jesus tells the story and he says, look, I, I go after the one and I bring him back in. Of course the 99 are important, but right now there is one that is hurting and is alone and is by himself and he's crying out for help. And Jesus goes, hold on, I'll be right back. It's crazy that Jesus you see in those stories and there's dozens more maybe we'll read some more later but um, he's in you 
Stop trying to be right. Pause long enough so that your heart will be moved. Listen, 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 listen to what Paul, he, he, Paul, Paul persecuted the outsiders. And, and one day Jesus says, meets him on a road and he says, look, you got to stop. You got to stop. Now you're going to, you're going to be on my team. And you're going to go tell the world of my goodness, my freedom, my hope, my peace that is found in my name. Paul goes, I'm in. Let's do this thing. And listen, listen to the appeal that Paul is making to that spirit of God that is within you. Listen to what he says. This is Philippians 2.3. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition, each of you, each one of you, in humility, be moved. Be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Each of you should be more concerned, not only about your own interest, but about the interest of others as well. He's calling out that new nature, that new creation spirit within you. And he's saying, look, put it aside. All your own stuff, put it aside and seek to understand what another is going through, that their lives might be more important than yours. He's calling out that spirit of Jesus Christ who in the middle of wherever Jesus was going, Jesus allowed himself to put aside his agenda, his direction, and say, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. I am being moved by someone that needs me that is being oppressed. Paul says it again in Romans 12, 9 through 11. He says, Let your, your love must be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And, and this is what he says. He says, be devoted to one another with mutual love, showing eagerness to honor one another. Do not lag in zeal. Be enthusiastic in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Endure in suffering. Be persistent in prayer. Be devoted to one another with mutual love, showing eagerness to honor one another. He's calling out to that new nature within you, saying, wake up. Every time we stifle it, every time we plug our ears to it, we are stifling the spirit of the living God within us. I'm done stifling. I've stifled it for long enough, my friends. I am done stifling. I'm done being right. I like being right sometimes. Ask my wife. She, <laughs> she, my poor wife. I like being right. I don't want to, Jesus, I don't want to stifle it anymore. I want your spirit of compassion and love to aflame within me. my friends, it's, it's not about Republicans or Democrats. You stop it with that. It's not about presidents or police. This is not about policies or systems. This is about a snake that entered into a garden. And his promise was that the Fulfillment would be found through self-centeredness and power. And it's also a story of a carpenter who hung from a tree, from a cross, in order to crush the head of that snake and to prove for once and for all that the throne belongs to him. That he is the one who sits on the throne. And that his throne is not one built on selfish ambition. But it's built on humility. 
It's a throne built on compassion. It's a throne built on love. And the name of the man that sits on that throne is Jesus Christ. And don't move another step in this conversation of racism, of injustice, of equality, of peace. Don't move another second if he is not at the absolute center of the conversation. It's not worth it. It's a waste of time. Honestly, it's a waste of time if Jesus Christ is not at the center. I know I don't fully understand, and I don't think I ever will, and I, 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 I'm trying, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to listen, I'm trying to open my heart up to what, what might be out there for me, and so I, I, I don't claim to know it all. I do believe I have the answer to the, to the problem, the solution, the remedy, and I believe his name is Jesus Christ. And I believe he came so that none would be lost, but all would be gathered by his name. That peace and hope and love and reconciliation and forgiveness would be found in his name. There is no other source of such things found anywhere else apart from him. They will all fade. They will all crumble. They will all let you down. I'm telling you, my friends, we are wasting our time if Jesus is not at the center of this conversation. Is there plenty of good we can be doing during this time to reconcile the racial injustice? Absolutely. Is there plenty of good that we can do during this time to thank our police officers for, for, for all that they do to serve us and love us and they're taking a bunch of heat right now? Uh, of course. Is there, is there laws we can vote into place to make change? Absolutely. But if Jesus isn't at the center, we're just wasting our time. So my friends, pause with me. Pause with me long enough so that you will be moved, so that the Spirit of God within you will be moved. Moved by compassion, moved by love. Let that Spirit of God that He has given you to shape this world for good, let it wake you up. Let it wake me up. That's all I got for now. I think I, I think I went a little long and I'm tired. But I am hopeful. I worship you, Jesus, because I know that you have the power to bring about change. My friends, join me. Join me in pausing to be moved. Join me in pausing to be moved into compassion, into love. I love you guys. I miss you. We're going to take communion. We do it every Sunday. And um, it's one of the most sacred things we get to do. We get to celebrate um, Jesus Christ who is moved by compassion. Even as he's hanging on the cross, he's like, forgive them. Forgive them for what they're doing to me. We do it every Sunday. We, we believe that there's power found in the name of Jesus Christ because of that cross that he hung from. And so we'll, we'll, we'll take it. Uh, I want to pray for us. Um, and then I want you to go have a beautiful day. Um, love you guys. And um, let me pray. Lord, we, we come to you. Who else would we come to? We've tried everything else, Lord. We come to you. We call on your name. We love you. 
We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the work of the cross. We thank you for the work of your resurrection. We thank you for your new spirit that in, is embedded in our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we give you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Have a good one. Bye. Oh, to think.